final message in this series called Interruptions? I hope so, because what happens a lot of times when we start these series, we start preaching on certain topics or certain texts from Scripture, God has a funny way of getting that stuff involved into our life. It's the old running joke. You never pray for patience. Right? Why? Because God will then allow you plenty of opportunities to be patient. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing with interruptions. Uh, you know, some of you have already shared some of the interruptions that have been taking place in your life uh, or how God might have interrupted you. And, and uh, you know, again, so if we get this series over, then the interruptions may slow down just a little bit. Can I get an amen for that? Right? Yeah. We're good, right? Um, I didn't ask permission to share this story, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a rule in my house, and any time I bring up my kids uh, in a sermon, I give them a dog. And so I owe them about three grand right now. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, Wyatt shared this story with me just the other day. And I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to tell you right now. It has nothing to do with the text for the day. It's just a funny story. Is it okay if we just laugh for a minute? All right. So he's telling me this story. Behind our house, there's a big trail. It's a, if you, I think if you go the whole thing, it's a little over five and a half miles long. And, and so he asked me, he's like, Dad, can I, I'm going to go take the bike out and I'm going to go ride the trail. And fine, whatever. So he comes back from this ride and begins to tell a story, really, that I'm making this connected interruptions. See, we always go to the left. When he and I go run together, we, we go to the left down this trail. Well, he was curious as to what was to the right. And so he takes off on his bike, he's all by himself, and he goes down the new part of this trail that we have not been on just yet. And, and he gets down there and he says, Dad, I was following the trail, and then the next thing I know, there's just nothing but corn. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and it, as you get to know why and his personality, it, this makes this even funnier. And he's like, it was kind of creepy. Kind of creepy. And he's like, I didn't know if the children of the corn were going to come out and get me up you know? And so, so he's, he's riding this thing, and he kind of rode to a point where he's like, okay, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to figure out how to get back, or I, I think if I go any further, I'm going to be on the news. One of those kind of feelings. <laughs> and so, so as, he, as he turns to come back, he's just pedaling away, coming back home, and, and um, there was a, 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 a first interruption, and the first interruption was a deer that ran out in front of him on that trail. We had just repaired the bicycle tire uh, like a couple of days before. And apparently, apparently, I didn't get it lined up very well. Because when he went to squeeze the brakes, the brake pads on the bike just went right underneath the back rim. They didn't stop the back tire. They just went right underneath it. And so he crashed into the deer. <laughs> on a bison <laughs> in the corn <laughs> and I'm like well, what happened he said dad the deer kind of staggered and just looked back at me as if to say really <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was funny enough all by itself but then he says I'm riding along a little bit more and I noticed up in the tree that there was a black squirrel and he goes, I've never seen a black squirrel before. He said, and as soon as I really had that thought, I've never seen a black squirrel before. It jumped out of the tree and hit me right in the chest. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the text we're going to be looking at is actually going to be um, ultimately about a woman who had come into town because she heard Jesus was in town, which was, if you've read scripture at all, you kind of see that seems to be a pattern. People find out Jesus is in town and they come flocking to hear him teach, to hear 
uh, hear him speak, to watch him perform miracles. And so she wanted to be where Jesus was, and Jesus had been in town for a little bit, and I'm really paraphrasing this up just to give us a little bit of context. Jesus is actually going to be on his way to go heal a sick child. And this woman, who has her own interruption in life, and we'll discover what that means here in just a second, she has her own life interruptions, she interrupts Jesus on the way to go heal this very sick child. And so we kind of have a double interruption thing going on here, but this interruption for this woman is, is life-changing. I mean absolutely life-changing, not moment-changing, but life-changing. And so I want to encourage you today, if you brought your Bible with you, to go ahead. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark today. Mark, which is Matthew, Mark, the second book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 34 today as we see an amazing interruption that has taken place. Mark chapter 5, and if it's on your, if you got your Bible app, feel free to use that too. But if you got it, say I got it. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Here's what the text says. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. That's called an interruption in your life. Can, can, can you just imagine that for a minute? Having an issue where you bleed 12 years. 12 years. That's an interruption. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, just like the deer, really? That's not in the text. It's just implied, everybody. Right? Think about this. And Jesus says, or he says, who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, are you serious? Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? And it goes on to say, but he kept on looking around. He being Jesus. Jesus kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And so today, what we want to talk about as we look at this idea of interruptions, Sometimes, life's interruptions require a bold leap of faith. Sometimes, life's interruptions require a bold leap of faith. Now, that almost sounds like a good church phrase, doesn't it? A bold leap of faith. It sounds good. It sounds like a Sunday school answer. It sounds like that's what we're supposed to say. So what the heck are we talking about when we say a bold leap of faith? Because we talk like that, church people, don't we? You, you can nod, yeah, right, right? We talk like that. We need to have a leap of faith. Take out on a leap of faith. But that's kind of where we leave it. It's just this theory thing up here. What does it really look like when we actually do take a bold leap of faith. And there's a couple things I want to point out today. The first one is this. A bold leap of faith 
propels you forward. A bold leap of faith propels you forward. How many of you remember gym class when you were in school? Right? Here's how I'm going to help us understand the difference between what we would call jumping and a bold leap, right? In gym class, we jumped rope, right? We just jumped rope. By the way, this is the only way I can jump rope. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we do that. We do jumping jacks and we jump, right? But we're not talking about jumping, we're talking about leaping. How many of you remember playing leapfrog? What happened? You moved. You went forward, right? And that's the difference I want to talk about. This idea isn't a jump. We're talking about a leap because a leap will propel you forward every single time. Because I can do jumping jacks in one place all day long. And I can accomplish the jumping jacks, but I'm not necessarily moving forward. If I am here and I want to get to there, is jumping going to do me any good? Or do I need to take a leap in order to get to where I want to be? You see, a bold leap of faith will propel you forward. And that's what this woman did. This woman, she didn't just jump up and down on the side of the road and kind of wave her hand and hope that maybe somebody would notice her. No, she took a bold leap into the crowd, through the crowd, all the way to Jesus. It was propelling her forward in that way. And she finally took the steps it took to get an audience with Jesus. Remember, she's been dealing with this for 12 years. So as we think about just the physical issue of that, put it in this perspective. If, if there's a huge difference between jumping and leaping, how much jumping has that poor woman done for 12 years? Can you imagine if that was what we were, the task we were given today? All right, everybody, stand up and jump up and down for 12 years. I'm not doing it. I don't know about you. That, 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 that's called exercise and futility, right? It's pointless. So for 12 years, she's been But today, today she took a bold leap of faith and she got the audience with Jesus. And I think it's the same thing for us in our own lives. As we think about the, the interruptions, the life's interruptions that we are dealing with, Excuse me, we have to ask that question. Am I jumping or am I leaping? Am I jumping or am I leaping? And, and here's the thing, I think so many of us, and again, this is, this, is not a, this is not a me talking to you, this is us, right? I think so many of us, we get so accustomed to jumping that we don't leap. And we have all kinds of reasons as to why we get stuck in that jumping thing. We don't look at it as just jump, excuse me, as just jumping up and down. We look at it because we say things like, well, you know, I know my circumstances. I know what, I know what I'm dealing with, but, but, you know, there's people that got it worse off than, than I do. I'm not going to worry about me. Ever been there? That's jumping in place, ladies and gentlemen. That's jumping in place. I know we all mean well when we say that. It's our, it's our way of trying to express and demonstrate humility even. It's a, it's a good thing in and of itself. But life's interruptions, when you need an audience with Jesus, you don't have to be, well, somebody else has gotten worse off than me. I'll just, I'll just stand here for another year and jump up and down. Leap of faith is what we really need. We we say other things too, We're like, well, you know, that that lady, well, she's been waiting a whole lot longer than I have. I guess I should just suck it up and, and deal with it. 
everybody's got problems. Ever said anything like that at all? You don't have to raise your hand because we all know we all do, right? We say things like that all the time. But here's the thing that really frightens me about us as people. I think so many times we're just so, simply so used to jumping up and down that we are actually afraid to leap because that means it's something new. We know this is dumb. We know this is pointless. We know there's no fruit. But if I jump over there, I don't know what's gonna happen. What if I don't stick the landing? <laughs> right? What if, what if, what if? We have all kinds of what ifs that, that, that we will place upon that situation because it's something new, it's something different, it's scary, it's a, it's a different direction. I don't know what happens. Let's say I do stick the landing. Ta-da! Right? I stick the landing, but oh shoot, what's next? I will think I'll just stay right here because I'm comfortable. Well, here's the thing. I want to share this quote with you today. It's from my dear friend who was my state pastor in Ohio for a long time, uh, Dr. Randy Spence. He says it this way. Until the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change, chances are we will not change. I'm going to leave that up there because I'm going to read that one more time. I want that to sink in for all of us, right? Until the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change, chances are we will never change. But if we want the audience with Jesus, we have to take the bold leap of faith. It's okay for you to say, I've had enough. I don't want this anymore. This isn't working anymore. I'm a living, breathing testimony of this. I don't, I'm not trying to bring attention to myself. I'm just trying to tell you that I know that pain. And it doesn't show up overnight. It takes a long time. I've lost 110 pounds so far in about a year and a half. Right? It wasn't until the pain of being almost 300 pounds was greater than the pain of change that anything actually happened. Oh sure, I ate a salad now and again hoping for the best, right? We've all been there, right? When we, when we talk about like weight loss programs and, and workout programs and things, it's not that you are incapable <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's none of those things. You know what it is? It's that pain of change has to show up first. Because it's your want to. Your want to has to be there. Okay? So until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, chances are we will not change. A bold leap of faith. That woman has been in pain for 12 years. She finally got to the place where she said, you know what? I don't know what's gonna happen over there. I don't know if it's gonna work, but I, the pain of this is enough, and I'm gonna go and take that bold leap of faith, all right? Here, what's the next thing we got for this today? Uh, a bold leap of faith changes where you put your trust. A bold leap of faith changes where you put your trust. Remember the text told us that, uh, that she had trusted in her wealth, it didn't say it in those words, but it said she had exhausted all of her financial resources into paying for, for doctors and treatments and things, right? So, but all of that was now gone. She had put her trust in her wealth. If I can just pay the doctor bill, then all will be well eventually. She had put her trust in, in the physicians of the day, the doctors of the day. She had gone and seen them, and the, the text even said it got worse, it didn't get better. Now here's what I want us to understand, because we, we really gotta get the, the total grasp of, of what this woman's dealing with. When that text talked about her going and seeing the doctors, she didn't make an appointment online 
verify her deductible. Okay? And she didn't sit in the lobby for an hour and a half reading highlights. Right? That's not what we're talking about here. The doctor she walked into to see didn't have multiple diplomas hanging on the wall. These doctors, in all honesty, were basically quacks. Quacks. That's who was doing these types of things. They were quacks. And so here's this woman who has basically, for a period of roughly 12 years, gone and seen doctor after doctor after doctor, and has been seeing quack after quack after quack, and has been basically given folk remedies to keep trying over and over again, all the while they keep taking money from her pocket. Now maybe some parts never change. <laughs> if you catch what I'm doing. <laughs> a couple of you did. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. Alright, but here's the thing. You want to know how these formulas were? In the Jewish Talmud, the Jewish Talmud is, which is, I'm going to sum it up this way. The Jewish Talmud is basically a book that was, uh, was giving instructions for everyday life. For the Jewish people. It was kind of how do you function, how do you survive, what do we do with this, what do we do with that. And in the Jewish Talmud, there are two, I'm going to pull out specifically, there were two remedies that were listed in the Talmud for her condition. Are you ready for these? The first one was this, carry the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen rag around one's neck in the summer and in a cotton rag in the winter. The looks on your faces are exactly what they should be. <laughs> because that was a prescribed remedy for this issue of bleeding. Here's the second one. If, if you didn't care for that one, we got another option. All right? Carry barley corn from the dung of a white female donkey. <laughs> got an HMO, you're probably going to get the lab. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just say, right? So th th this is what this woman has gone through. This is her experience, right? This is where she has put her trust into these things. But when she propelled forward and she got that audience with Jesus, immediately it changes who she trusts. She trusted Jesus. Now, it's real easy for us to hear these crazy remedies and go, what idiots would do stuff like that? That doesn't even make sense, right? Who would, who would ever in a million years believe that that would be a successful cure? Well, folks, let me, let me submit to us that we do the same thing. I'm not saying you're pulling barley corn out of dung. But what I am saying is so many of us reach out and put our trust in the most unhelpful, unreliable and unproven sources that we can find. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, how many of you have ever had a problem in your marriage or your relationship? Don't look at each other. Don't be a quiet right now. But in your, in, in your marriage or, or even if you're just dating, you've got problems. And you, maybe you're fighting, you're arguing all the time, there's tension and everything else. And what have we often as people found ourselves doing? We go to our friends for help and advice. We go to our friends that are on their second or third marriage. <laughs> we go to our friends who have been dating for two weeks. We, 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 we reach out and we put our trust in ridiculous things like that, right? You know how many good, well-meaning Christian people I know post their horoscope on social media? Seriously, what? If I see one more stupid text on Facebook about what kind of a potato I'm going to be, or, you know, I mean, it's like, what are you doing? But the test said this, and so I'm going to do that. Holy cow. See, we still, to this day, we don't need to separate ourselves from these real-life people of Scripture. You know, Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun, right? So we, too, do the same thing. Where are we putting our trust? 
Because the whole idea of an interruption in life means it's an opportunity to take that bold leap and begin to put our trust in something true, something faithful, something that will actually work, being Jesus Christ. We end up just like the woman, don't we? Broke sometimes. Because we follow really bad advice. We end up worse off than when we started because we put our trust in the wrong places. But here, check this out. One of my favorite texts of scripture, and it's a very simple one. I want you to read with me the first four words. Okay? Let's do that together. Read with that with me. Trust in the Lord. Okay, let's do that one more time. Trust in the Lord. Right? That's it's so easy to kind of gloss over some of these verses, especially if you've been in the church for a long time, because you probably learned that at a VBS when you were six, right? No, this is a big deal. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Not on your own understanding or Uncle Bob's understanding. Or, or, or the neighbor's understanding. Trust in the Lord and don't lean on anything outside of Him. Right? And we've got to completely trust in Him. In all of our ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. That's a nice way to say that we trust in the Lord and we lean on Him. He will deal with our interruption. Now, the results may not be what we hoped or even asked for, but that's not the point. And we're going to see that in just a minute, too. But when we trust in the Lord, we will make it through any situation we may be facing today. Can I get an amen for that? I need to know you believe that today. Amen. Okay? Good, good. Now, here's the next thing. A bold leap of faith brings you close to Jesus. A bold leap of faith brings you close to Jesus. This woman, in her bold leap of faith, physically got closer to Jesus. And all reality is the same for us, too. She took that bold leap. She didn't know what it was going to look like when she got there. She didn't know how the crowd was going to treat her. She didn't know if she was even going to time it out right. You know, oh man, if I, if I, if I start now, I, I, I might be able to get there before Jesus turns the corner and he's gone forever. I don't know if I'm even going to make it. But she trusted in this fact that if I got to take this bold leap, I'm going to get close to Jesus. I just got to get close to Jesus. I don't have to sit at his feet and, 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 and take notes of the teaching that he's going to be doing. I don't have to be one of his posse that travel with him everywhere he goes. I just have to get close to Jesus. And that's what a bold leap of faith looks like. It's getting closer to Jesus. Even if you don't know the outcome. Even if you don't think you might make it. She didn't know if she was going to be healed or not. This was not a guarantee. This was an act of faith on her part. If she knew she was going to be healed, why did it require faith? She didn't know. But she knew that the only hope that she could possibly have would be to get close to Jesus. And here's what I'm going to learn from this today. The whole idea of what was it going to look like? What were the results going to be? Not the point. Not the point whatsoever. Getting close to Jesus is the point. No matter the outcome. Getting close to Jesus is the point because getting close to Jesus, church, is enough. We just have to get close to Jesus. Even if the healing doesn't come, you did not lose because you got close to Jesus. Even if the situation isn't remedied in the time frame that you really hoped it would be, it doesn't matter. That wasn't the point. The point was to get close to Jesus. Let me, let me put it to you this way. So many of us have 
have heard stories and descriptions about heaven and what it's going to be like and what it's going to look like. And, and we've all seen movies and cartoons of, of all these, these things of where people paint pictures. You know, there's always like little angels floating on clouds and, you know, everybody's got wings. We've seen all kinds of crazy pictures and ideas of what heaven might look like. You know, the streets will be gold and there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more crying and there'll be no more sorrow and, and all of these great things. And people have a longing for heaven. Oh, I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get there. Jesus built a house just for me. I can't wait to get to heaven. This is going to be awesome. Let me ask it to you this way. All the things that we know about heaven. If Jesus wasn't there, would you still want to go? That's the point. The whole point is to get close to Jesus. Because Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is our life. Jesus is our reason. Jesus is the subject. Get close to Jesus and that will be the faith. And you will be accomplishing exactly what you need. But get this, we often talk about getting close to Jesus, but did you notice in the text, Jesus is like, who touched me? And they thought he was an idiot because there's a crowd of people everywhere. Jesus, the answer to your question is everybody touched you, right? Everybody touched you. Jesus didn't relent, did he? He didn't relent. He said, who touched me? I, I, I got to find out. And the text said, he, being Jesus, he kept looking in the midst of the crowd. Jesus kept looking for the one who took a bold leap of faith to come close. Jesus was looking for her. And it's the same thing for us, church. We got to get this. See, when we draw close to Jesus, he draws close to us. This is why we say this whole idea of following Jesus is not about religion. It's about a relationship. Jesus wants to be close to you. Jesus wants to be close to all of us. He wants us to draw close to him as a relationship. He wants to be there. We need to be together. Me and Jesus. You and Jesus. And you will find that no matter what interruption is going on in your life, Jesus already knows about it. He cares about it and wants to be right by your side and walk with you through it. we got to take those bold leaps of faith. As the old hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in, in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If I can keep my eyes on Jesus, if I can draw close to Jesus, I might even discover that what's troubling me right now, whatever it might be, no matter how bad it might be, it just is going to pale in comparison to the glory and grace of looking upon the face of Jesus Christ. And maybe that's the point Jesus wants us to discover. Don't focus on the things of this world. They're temporary. They're temporary. Focus on. Focus on me. Don't allow all the stuff to distract you and discourage you and bring you down and frustrate you and make you want to give up. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Draw close to him. Here's the next one. A bold leap of faith transforms your position. A bold leap of faith transforms your position. Now, this isn't talking about position for moving from A to B. The text said, this woman had been dealing with this for 12 years. Can you imagine the discouragement, the disheartenment, the frustration, the anger, the anxiety, all the things, 
right? That's what this woman has been dealing with, and that's where she is. She's kind of at the bottom of the barrel. She's at the end of her rope. She's as low as she can possibly go. That is her current position. All of the emotional pain that she has endured over 12 years. I mean, think about that for a minute. Is this my fault? What am I doing wrong? What's wrong with me? Right? Just some of those very simple questions. Waking up again, you know, you prayed that night, God, please take this away from me, and you woke up the next morning, and it's still there. So you, you kind of ride the emotional roller coaster on a daily and, and a weekly basis. She has been through tremendous emotional pain. She has encountered so much uh, relational pain that I can't even fathom it. I'm an extrovert, and, and, and I need people, right? I have to have people. She had no one. She had no one. Not because she was a horrible person. Text never tells us anything about her character or her personality or anything else. But we know from reading scripture that she was considered in her culture to be unclean because of this bleeding issue. And so there was no man in her life. Now, don't misunderstand me, ladies. I'm not saying you have to have a man in your life. Okay? Uh, we have to have you. <laughs> but uh, you, you don't have to have us. Right? And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that wasn't even a possibility for her. No relationship of any kind. There was no marriage. There was no dating. There was none of that. She had friends and family who couldn't be near her, couldn't come around. She couldn't come around them. Thanksgiving comes along, and she's outside looking in the window because she's separated from them. Right? Relational pain. Of, of, of a mass amount. I can't even believe how hard that had to be for her that alone. We're struggling with COVID because we can't see each other the way we're used to. Multiply that by a thousand for this poor woman for 12 years. Physical pain. I have to believe that if you're bleeding for 12 years, it's going to hurt once or twice. Right? Physical pain that she's had to endure. Oh, and don't forget the religious pain. The religious pain. Because you know, as you read through scripture, it was very common when there was something wrong with you physically that it was attributed to the sin in your body. You know, you're born blind? Well, what sin did your parents commit? She's bleeding for 12 years. So how many times has she heard from the religious leaders and, 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 and those in the synagogue that she must be a sinner? She keeps sinning because this has been 12 years. She's got to go off. By the way, she can't even go worship. We struggled as church people to have a couple of months where we couldn't meet in person. 12 years, this woman has not been able to be side by side with her faith family doing life together, encouraging one another, singing songs together, praying together for 12 years. Can you imagine the religious pain that she's had to endure? So you see, when we think about this, this is where she is. That's her position, her current position. But what did Jesus say when he turned around and found her? What did he say? Daughter. Daughter miss that one simple word. That one word changed everything for this woman. Jesus himself called her daughter. She is part of the family now. Her position from the bottom of the barrel to a seat at the table, she is part of the family all because she took that bold leap of faith and her position has been transformed by Jesus himself. She's a part of the family now. She's included. How many of you have just ever wanted to be included? I don't need to be the best friend. I don't need to have all the, right? But I, I just want to be included. Ever been there? I know some of our, with our kids and our students going back to school right now. That's a big deal. I just want to be included. I don't want to be ostracized. 
She is now included. She is now loved. She is loved, and she's loved by Jesus, the Messiah, the King of all kings. She is loved in this moment, and she belongs. See, if you have a daughter, they belong in your household. They belong to your family. And she was called daughter. So all of that in the matter of Jesus speaking to her, touching her body, and all because she took the bold leap, her position from just laying on the ground, ready to quit, ready to give up. And now she is a daughter of the king. That's what happens, church, when we take that bold leap of faith. Our position will be transformed. No matter who you think you are right now, no matter what you think you are right now, you can be transformed to a son, daughter of the Most High God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, Therefore, and by the way, whenever you see, we don't have time today, but this is a little nugget for you. Anyone, anytime you see the word therefore in scripture, that means you have to go back and see what it's there for. <laughs> therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Position transformed simply by being a new creation in Jesus Christ. And then finally, bold leap of faith can bring peace. Bold leap of faith can bring peace. See, the, the word that was used for peace here has the connotation to it of wholeness. Wholeness and, and well-being. See, it's not just, we hear the word peace, and, and most of the time we think about the absence of problems. If there's, if there's no problems, then, then whoo, we finally got peace. Right? No, but peace isn't about that. It's about wholeness. It's about well-being. It's about the entire person. Right? And so, so many of us were trying our absolute best in the midst of whatever interruptions of life we have. We're trying to make ourselves whole. Because we know as a human being, we are not well, something's off, something's missing. But that's because we have a hole inside of us that needs the peace of Jesus Christ. And that hole that's inside of us, we try to fill with anything and everything we can. Trying to bring peace into life's interruptions. We fill that hole with food. I've been there. I've been there. Right? Fill it with food. Even if we don't know it, you know, when we're like, when we're stressed out, when we're depressed, and we turn to food, we're trying to fill the hole that is inside of us. For some folks, it's, it's drugs. We turn to drugs. Why? Here's, here's what I want very plain to all of us today. No one on this planet ever woke up one day and said, you know what? I think I'm going to become a drug addict. No one. No one. We become drug addicts. We become alcoholics. We become all those things because there is pain inside of us in a very deep place, and we have a longing for peace, and that drug or, the, or that alcohol, whatever it might be, even sex we use as a, as a tool to try to fill the hole inside of us. We use all those things because we need peace. But church, I'm telling you, the only thing that's going to fill that hole is Jesus Christ. Because that hole inside of you is God-designed and it's God-shaped. He's the only thing that can fill it. And then, and only then, will peace come. Do not misunderstand me today. Problems in life will still be there. Problems in life will still be there. But in the midst of those storms, you can have peace that the Bible describes as that it passes all understanding, meaning that it makes absolutely no sense why I have peace in the midst of all the garbage going on around me. That's what a bold leap of faith that Jesus can do in your life. Bold leap of faith can 
finally bring you that peace that you're longing for, that you've been actually praying about for a long time. Psalm 29 says this, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Strength and peace. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, as the old hymn says, right? Strength for today. Isn't that what we want? God, I'm struggling right now. Can you just help me get through today? Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine. And what are those blessings? That's that peace you're longing for. That's it. That's it. So church, I want to challenge us with this question today as we close. Do you need to take a hold? Do you need to take a bold leap of faith today? I don't know what circumstances are going on in your life. Maybe there is physical healing that you need, or relational healing, or some emotional healing. Take that bold leap of faith today. Jesus will not be mad at you for interrupting. In fact, the moment you touch his robe, he wants to know who it was. Who was that? Who was that? I'm going to keep looking for them until I find them. Do you need to take a bold leap of faith today? Are there relationships in your life that are just greatly strained? And you need to take a bold leap of faith so that reconciliation and healing can take place there. Do that today. Jesus will help you through those things too. And the peace that you and your family or you and your friends or whatever it might be, what all that peace you're looking for, Jesus will provide that for you in the midst of whatever situation you're dealing with. Is God calling you to something? And you're going, I don't know, Jesus. That's different. I've never done that before. I don't think I'm qualified. You know? I, I, I don't know why you're picking me. Take that bold leap of faith today and watch how Jesus wants to use you. And maybe for you today, you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that's the bold leap that you need to take first. And I want to encourage you and invite you to take that bold step today. There's no magical prayer to pray. It's simply us coming to Christ, acknowledging the fact that we have sinned and fallen short of his glory, and he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you, my friend, will have your position transformed in that instant to the child of the king. Is that the bold leap of faith you need to take today? I want to invite you to. So as we, as we continue worship in song, I want to invite you to come today. If you need to pray about that, please do so. There's just some altars up here at the front, just a place where we can humble ourselves before the Lord and pray. And maybe today, whatever's on your heart, whatever the Holy Spirit's leading you to, maybe for you, it just needs to be between you and God. You don't need anybody to pray with you. In fact, you may not even want anybody to pray with you right now. If that's you, would you come to the altar over here on the right-hand side? And I promise you, nobody's going to bug you. Nobody's going to come pray with you. Just you and Jesus, and that, that's perfectly fine. But if there's something going on in your life, and you need somebody else to just go to the Lord with you, then come to the altar here to my left. I'd be honored and happy to pray with you today. Whatever interruption of life, whatever circumstance of life that you need to bring before the Lord. But I want to encourage you to do that today. It's the Holy Spirit leads. Pray with me. God, thank you for all of your transforming power. Thank you for being such a good father that you don't mind when your kids interrupt you. And God, I think maybe above all things, we say thank you for caring so much about us. And even in the midst of all the crowds of life, you look for us. 
you find us. So God, today, I simply ask that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and our minds and begin giving us the strength and the courage to take whatever bold leap of faith you're leading us to today that we can know based on what we read in your word today that we need not fear and we need not have all the answers we just need to come close to you so God as we pray draw close to us as we come to you but thank you in advance for what you're doing in our hearts today in our families God even in our community thank you amazing God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, you're invited to come as a praise team sings. Stand with me as we sing. signs poked in the grass out there. And those signs are part of, of a program that Kiwanis has participated in that is dealing and helping to deal with suicide prevention. Um, and, and that is something that's very near and dear and special to me. And to me, goes right along with what we talked about today. We have men and women and boys and girls all over <laughs> our community who have been struggling for years and are rowing the very same boat as a woman was in our text today in some way, shape, or form. And so out in the uh, lobby here, we have more signs that we want to encourage you to take home and pop those in your yard too. Because you know what? A simple word of encouragement, a simple statement of kindness can go a really, really long way. And for you introverts, you didn't have to talk to anybody. Amen? Amen? There you go. There you go. You're awake. So here's the thing. I want to encourage you. Take the signs. Take them home. Display them proudly. And in these days ahead, when you see the sign that you've taken, remember to pray for those who are struggling right now 
with depression and anxiety and all of the things that bring us to a place where we feel hopeless. Jesus is big enough and he can heal. We believe that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, church, I want you to know something. You are loved. No matter what, you are loved. Not just by me, but by the king of all kings. And now you get the privilege and the honor to go tell somebody else that this week. Show the love of Christ and share the love of Jesus everywhere you go this week that the kingdom might forever be changed because God used you. Church, we love you and you are dismissed.